And there it is, that easy these days. So we're live uh, all the way from Austin, Texas to Berlin, Germany. Uh, we've got Pat Patrick and Eves with us from VUCA Simulations. So welcome, guys. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, just for everyone's edification, as folks join in uh, today, we'll be having a chat with the, the lads from VUCA about Red Strike. And the, the designer deep dive is really focused on trying to understand how the game came about, everything from, you know, it's, uh, it's already the idea for it, which I can see a game in the background that might have something to do with it uh, behind Eves there. And uh, the artwork and the maps and the counters and the rules and the, all that sort of mechanics and all that sort of fun stuff. So we're going to, we started a few minutes late. We're going to schedule 45 minutes to an hour, but it's uh, pretty flexible today since it's Sunday, but it's evening, uh, 9 p.m. for you guys, right? 8. 8 p.m. You know, I, so you must be on summertime. You're still on summertime over there, right? I was looking online to get the, the time right, so uh, my apologies. All right. Um, so let's get started. And I thought what we might do first is have one of you tell us a little bit about VUCA simulations, who, who's involved in the company and uh, why you started the company. I know you had a name change. I like the new name. I think it's cool. Uh, and uh, I'm very curious to hear about, you know, sort of your origin story for the company. I think people would like to know a little bit about that. Sure. So let me introduce myself. I'm Patrick, yeah. uh, 35 years old. That's uh, pretty young in the hobby, I think. Yeah, and um, yeah, I was uh, I got started playing war games uh, in 2007. It was when I was studying, so I had to um, check the money <laughs> because money was short at that time. So I thought the best bang for the buck would be uh, to buy uh, Case Blue, which was <laughs> basically <laughs> the first war game. And first real war game I got. Wow. So that gave me some uh, hours of enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, so we were living in a small flat. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was uh, playing war games since then, and my collection grew. And uh, I met more and more people involved in the hobby. Um, yeah, so um, one day I joined the uh, GHS which is a German kind of club for conflict simulations. And there I uh, met Dirk, uh, Dirk Blenemann, who is a game designer, mm -hmm. pretty well known, I guess. And he, um, yeah, we began to talk and we had the same um, philosophy uh, of some things like, uh, I think the space issue is uh, often seen in the hobby. We wanted to um, find, uh, or we wanted to play games that mm -hmm. are more uh, interactive, easy to learn, and um, yeah. So one thing came to another. And then we started to to create Crossing the Line, our first game, and since then we are uh, constantly um, talking to other designers and working on other projects and having a good good time, right? So that's. A short summarization. A short summary, fantastic. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and for your edification, I'm in the early part of turn two of crossing uh, the boat. The boat. Crossing the oh. river. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm struggling as the Germans. We're 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 not doing very well. Uh, the Russians are putting up a stout defense. So uh, <laughs> good stuff. But uh, now tell me, so with and we'll, Eves will come right to you in just a sec. So. Patrick, with your early adoption uh, of get wargaming, when you look back on your gaming, your start in gaming with OCS of all things, uh, so do you look back at OCS and go, oh, it's still awesome? Or do you say, ah, oh, well, you know, there are so many new systems and different things that we could play that are more manageable? Uh, or or what, what, what are your feelings about it today? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, fantastic. Uh, I like to dig into the rule books, uh, right. game specific rules, right. um, get yeah, get it set up on the table, play some turns. But I think it's more kind of a solitaire experience. 
Yeah. Because I have some guys, even in Germany, who uh, play the system. But um, every time we meet, it's like uh, you have to sit there and wait for your opponent like two or three hours to do his turn. So I think it's a really, really great system. And they are very cool uh, games. But uh, it's more of a solitaire more of a solo endeavor. game for me. Personally. Right, right. And I, I kind of feel the same way. It, yeah. it's, uh, unless you can find a smaller scenario that's got a little pace. Yes. To it right and uh I, I do know that a lot of the guy all the the we'll call them the old school gentlemen who play ocs they often will have uh an scs game set up on the side <laughs> so that when it's the germans turn or the russians turn or whoever's turn they go off and play that and then we're like okay come on back in and so they're getting two games for the price of one i guess so that's yeah, that's, uh, that's what we uh, did at a convention <laughs> right we played not ocs but uh, the battle for normandy from jim oh games. yeah yeah that's a big game too right yeah right so in one week we didn't make it <laughs> obviously <laughs> but um yeah then we had the same uh thing so one of us went away from the table played some other games <laughs> right 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 okay um, they are fascinating right? oh yeah it is fascinating okay so you're you you're you're still a fan uh after Absolutely. the years so Absolutely. so eves uh i'm glad you're sitting upright and feeling well i know you've been not uh, not particularly healthy so that's great and we're not gonna we're not gonna make your life hard tonight uh so tell tell me about your involvement with the company and and how how you got engaged with Buka. Well, i'm a little bit older than patrick i'm 52 now in a couple of in two weeks time i will have my 52 birthday. Well, congratulations happy birthday thanks <laughs> Um, I've been in Wargaming since 1977 or 8, 78, I don't know exactly when. I started with Panzer Gruppe Guderian, mm. the first game that I got as a present from my parents. And uh, uh, if they would have known that this would be my hobby for the, last, for the rest of my life, <laughs> they wouldn't have that bet on that. <laughs> so I'm pretty right. happy with the hobby. I'm doing, I'm, I like all sorts of these games. I dig into all of the systems. When there is something new that comes out, I want to check it out and just take it in it's not always my cup of tea but that's not really a problem i just want to find out how it works and uh, often it is my cup of tea sometimes i buy a whole series i don't know if any if that ha has happened to you you buy the whole series and then you start to play it and you think oh this is not really what i want to, to play right so yeah. the series, yeah. for example. So, I, I may i may have sold oh i don't know maybe 200 games right so things yeah. that i go oh this is i bought all these guys and no and off they go to the side yeah right right right, right. Yeah. but you have to sell when you don't like them so but that's not the problem of the designer that's more a kind of taste that you have or that of course have. yeah yeah so um there are really no uh so i really wanted to try out everything and one of the games that really was uh, was hooking me in 1990. That was Gold Strike and Against mm -hmm. Strike also. Mm -hmm. And I always was uh, waiting for Mr. Herman to make a Central Front game on the same system, but he never did. And when I started to do it for me, I did it. I, I started in 2009 with the game. When I started with the design, well, with doing a game for me, I, I wouldn't call it design. I found out uh, why he didn't do it. It's not doable. Uh, the same system on that scale is absolutely not feasible. The scale has to change, uh, there are so many rules that have to change. And so I started to take from all the games that I have played that I love. I started to take out this and that and that and I, I put it together. So I wouldn't call myself a designer. Apart from that, I would okay. uh, one, one thing is before you say one more, would you uh, maybe either lean, come, come a little closer to your microphone because we're, we're getting, it's getting um, a little muted and, I, and, and I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. That's better now? Oh, wonderful. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, there we go. And so so you were saying that um, you're, 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 you weren't really designing, but you were making for yourself mm -hmm. and then you realized why he never made the game. For yeah, the why, 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 probably he didn't do it because it's right. uh, doable. Right. So I have, I have kept uh, the interactivity, and that's what Pat Patrick uh, liked about most about the game. That's the that you are really not waiting for somebody. You, you yes. never have to wait because you always have to interact. You do air interceptions, you do naval interceptions. Uh, there is there are a lot of segments where you play than the other plays, but you always have to react on what he's doing. So if I attack your air bases, you have to intercept. If you, if yes. I attack uh, ground units, you have to, to move your reserves. So it's very interactive, and that is. The main part that I kept from the, the Gold Strike system, that was what we liked both most, I think, Patrick. Right. 
And um, for the rest, there is a lot of new things, tactical nuclear war that was not included in Egan Strike or, or Gold Strike, for example. All right, but um, and also, also special forces, and you've got, um, I'm just looking at the air defense network stuff as well. I, 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 so I took the time, I got through maybe half the rules uh, before our, our, our chat, so I, I apologize for not being completely up to date on the entire system, and I haven't played it, so I, I can't comment on it, but certainly very much more concise and clearer rules than Mark's rule book, which while it was good, it was verbose, and things were often repeated multiple times in multiple places, and it made it very difficult to actually ascertain really what you were supposed to be doing. I've only played a GN strike, and I think if I was going to be honest, I got maybe two turns done, and I just went, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was indeed my first game against strike before I got gold strike. Right. And I have to say, it, it, it's a tough nut, and the rules, there were some, I wouldn't, some things weren't quite clear. Yes. And that's something that I hate about rules when they are not really clear, and I hope that we have done better this time. We are still working on them, so it's just right. not the final version. Right. Yeah, Yeah. okay, and that's great. Good. Well, and So I think they're doing great uh, so far. In fact, I've got a, a little image behind me of your, of uh, part, part of the, one of the map, either maps or uh, uh, air, airfield locations, whatever the case may be, and here's a That's the strategic map in fact, strategic yeah. map. And then, no, oh, we really can't see this because it's there's three of us, but terrain the terrain is well defined in the rules as well, it's all very clear and crisp. And uh, well, this is counters, and you can't see it, dang, dang it. All right, I'll uh, I'll just put this one back up. But the counter art is a massive improvement, right? But we're getting ahead of ourselves, so you built you took. The framework of the rules and really the sequence of play, which is highly interactive, and then went through and looked at what systems will be needed to uh, deal with that the time period that you're focused on, right. in terms of nuclear and uh, air, air defense networks and special forces and all that sort of fun stuff, and then uh, and then from there, what what changed for you what changed from your perspective in the system that for like movement and combat did you change a lot in that uh, regard as well yeah yeah, yeah much uh, for example there are no zones of control mm -hmm. uh, i found it very difficult to have these sticky ones and not sticky ones and uh, mm -hmm. when you have a zone of control for a mechanic and what a mechanized yes. division yes. Yes. and i found it very uh, awfully a lot of work for not well i don't say that it's not worth it but uh, it was not my cup of tea sure uh, that's maybe uh, the point that has changed the most but uh, patrick uh, he's always pushing me to make it more playable i had so much chrome in the game uh, that was nice but that was really uh, doing it hard to work uh, to, to play the game so right um, i'm pretty happy that uh, patrick is always pushing me farther yeah we will have uh, a we will have uh, lots of optional rules. Right, right. Rules, right? Yeah, well, I, I, I was surprised, actually, when I read the, the base rule book, which is, I think, clocks in around 30 or 35 pages, couple the version I have. Your advanced rules were only a couple of pages. So you're looking to either A, expand upon that, or B, add optional rules that will allow you to put some chrome, chrome on things. Yeah, that's right. The optional rules will be very often very small things. For example, there will be Patriot. Patriot will be included as optional rule. So you don't have it in the standard game, neither in the advanced game. Uh, they are important, but only five, I think five or six units had them at that time. So gotcha. uh, we, were, we were putting it out of the, of, the, of the standard game because it was some exception that you have to have in mind when you play the game. And in this case, for example, Patriot, it's just when you're really in the game, then you can uh, choose to, to play with Patriot uh, anti-ballistic missile systems. Or, for example, in the advanced game, uh, I stuck to, to the original detection rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and Patrick was, again, uh, asked me, can we, can't we do this a little bit easier? So uh, in the standard game, it's very simplified version. I think it, it, uh, it renders good that you have to detect someone before you can shoot at him. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's it's nice. It it works fine. It works fine. Um, but if you really want to have the the, the, the meaty uh, detection rules, 
then you go to the advanced game, which are not that complicated indeed, but it's much more relying on tables, having a look and doing it more, more often. In the standard game, you make one detection attempt, and in the advanced rules, you make multiple detections. Multiple, right. Right, so and, and, and Nagel, ship-to-ship uh, -ship detection is slightly different too, isn't it? As well. In the, in the yeah, game. I don't know which rules version that you have, but... Um, um, it's uh, 0 0.1. Yeah, it, it has changed in the meantime. Okay. Naval naval detection, uh, no, I would say naval, surface naval units are now always detected in standard game okay. and in the advanced game. But we are thinking about bringing it back in the advanced rules. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That, I thought that was interesting. Uh, I, I, and one of the, that's kind of a hallmark of uh, Mark, Herm, Mark Herman's designs, too. If you look at the Pacific War and the, you know, the Gulf Strike system and all that, he's always had this. Uh, this I would call it robust detection system, right? So you got to find the guy before you can shoot the guy. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a big part of trying to get in, in the battle, right? Even back in ancient days, you had to work out where the hell people were marching before you could sort of corner them and, and have a battle, right? Yeah, I think that was a hallmark of the Civil War, where people often, they didn't look for somebody, but they found themselves. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. developing, which was not planned. And uh, that, that's some kind of, in modern warfare, that's really, really important. At the end of the 80s, there were, there were already um, satellite passes. So it's defendable that uh, surface naval units are detected. But it, um, well, I would like to see it back as an optional rule, at least already in the advanced rules. But that's something we are going to I think to he's do. making a pitch to you, Patrick, right there. <laughs> 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 And that's, I think that's the, the uh, hardest part in development, right? <clears throat> to to um, look how to um, cut out some of the mechanics to make yeah. it uh, more playable. Right. Well, and your your fascination with uh, Dean Essex systems yeah. is a great uh, benchmark for you because he, he carves words out and rules out that are redundant, right? Yeah. So if they don't add value, and they're not enhancing the gameplay or making the gameplay easier, then why is it there, right? Because it's very easy, I think, as a designer to go, oh, well, look, at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday, this happened, and it's really important, and so we've got an exception. And I can think of one game that I didn't even get finished setting up that's set in World War II in the bulge uh, that is so, there is so many things going on in that game that you're kind of like, yeah, I really need the designer to hold my hand and walk me through this versus being able to read the rules, set it up and play it, right? So Yeah, it's a famous pasta rule. I well, know. yeah, there's a, well, there's a, that <laughs> game as well, right? So I was I was thinking of a more modern release, actually. So uh, that's but interesting. That's a good example that you gave. For, for, for example, in the beginning, uh, the supply rules, they were, uh, there were supply rules indeed. And they were, you had to go to draw to a headquarter and then to supply depot or supply yes. depot headquarter to port and whatever. So it's totally normal. But uh, Patrick was one of his first views of the game. He said, how often does it happen that somebody's out of supply? Well, nearly never because there are so many headquarters and so many supply all around. And uh, right. so, and that's when he said, yeah, then it doesn't really give something. It doesn't something add value. Right. It's right. No, there's no added value. So. Let's simplify it, and uh, yeah, and yeah, and I think uh, I'm going to take this background off and just put that on. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> that's a really valuable point there. Uh, it's interesting how you know some folks will say, well, if it doesn't have supply, it's not a real, not a real war game, right? It's particularly at the, oper the at, 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 at that operational scale, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and I forget what the turn time. What's the time here? On, uh, Two days. Two days, one, right? One so, two days. so the 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 cadence of resupply in a modern context is going to be pretty high, and so for someone to be placed out of supply, I think that's going to be pretty challenging in, with, with with the mod, modern day systems, right? And unless you could completely isolate a unit, even then you can airdrop, right? Uh, so I think that's a smart choice to kind of uh, sort of downplay the logistical aspects unless it you know unless it's a chrome thing or whatever. and and also it doesn't mean there's no uh, supply um, simulated in the game uh, there is actually but it's mechanically easy 
Right. right. Because you have uh, certain operations you want to conduct with your forces and you have to pay supply. It's a great right. point. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So, so the rules, the rules are being extensively revised and reviewed and changed and updated uh, to suit the period. Was there a rationale behind choosing 1989 versus 85 or 81 or 72 or whatever the case may be? Wow. That's a long time ago. I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> That's but, okay. But I think it was in 2009 that I started the game. And so 2009, 1989. And I think there was there were a lot of games, well, a lot, Third World War, NATO. There yeah. were a lot of games that were doing uh, Third World War games, uh, but in the 70s and the 80s, early 80s. So it was just like, okay, uh, this is now 30 years from now. And uh, maybe then we take 20 years, sorry. So maybe I just uh, choose the last moment when it could have happened. And the, um, the narrative is indeed that Mikhail Gorbachev is outside of the US, of the USSR, sorry. And then it's a military coup that happened really in 1991. So right, it could right. have happened in 89. Right. And uh, the generals say, okay, now we, we, go, we go for it and we want to, uh, to, win, to win this communist uh, war. So that was a little bit the rationale behind it. It's the last moment that they could have done anything. And I agree that it is hard, but that's why, why the victory conditions are have to be adapted to uh, right. be un, uh, realistic. Right. And so with, uh, with 89 as the premise and your, your design there, how, was it, how hard was it to find the orders of battle and you know have all the right stuff? I mean, I know Fabrizio was here watching and he did yeah. extensive but research I, and all that. So it's it's uh, it's totally uh, that was the, the I don't know how to describe it. It, <laughs> it was a really really hard work. Uh, in two thousand nine, of course, internet was quite expanding already. But when I did now the overview of the order of battles, I found so many new informations. Uh, that's uh, of, I, I I have bought and sold I don't know maybe fifty or sixty books about it. I went to air shows to buy out of print books mm. that were smelling there. And uh, I, 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 go, I went through them to, to find uh, all details. I had a, a translator for the, Czech, um, for the Czech and for the Russian air forces, because there were only Russian sites for in Czech. So uh, there was nothing in English. And uh, that was in 2009, 10 and 11. And I even remember that I had some contact with Fabrizio and also with Stuart, uh, is it Stuart uh, Tong from, Blue Water Navy. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 We, we also had some conversations and he was also looking for out of battles and well, the, the, the few things that I had, uh, well, was not really uh, that developed that what he has now in his game. So it, it was really hard. Uh, nowadays, it was easier. Nowadays, I have to say, um, the review of all the order battles, uh, now it is an updated version, totally updated version of the 2010 order of battle that I could find. And nowadays it's, um, the internet has grown. Uh, that's a good Yes, thing there is so much, so much information available, I guess, and archives are being released and things are being yeah. made and not top secret. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me a little bit about, as we look at order of battle, tell me a little bit about the counter designs and the artwork behind the designs. I noticed, and they may have, they may be changing, I don't know, but what I've seen in the rules really really crisp and clean i like the white circles behind the numerals and the numerals are colored for for you know, by, so that gives it uh it gives you a hint mentally to uh what it's for so t can you talk to the folks a little bit about uh the um i'll just say two i'll just say two things about it and then i'll let patrick explain it because he's uh, the graphical instructor Okay. Great. Uh, but but my, my opinion about the counter is uh, he has to to uh, to give you the information that you need to play the game, and that information must be readable. And uh, both things, I think, uh, our graphical uh, coordinator editor has has done really well up till now, and I like it really. I, I like it a lot. Um, some people say there are too many numbers on it. It's too many on it. But the less you put on the counter, the more you have to look at tables and in rules. Right. I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try and keep. So go ahead, Patrick. I'm going to see if I can bring yeah, up sure. some some artwork here while you. So talk. actually, we went to several iterations of the graphic design 
for the counters. Um, I think they are, um, together with the map, the most important um, playing pieces of war games. And um, yeah, I, I also share the, the view of the point of view from um, Eve, so that we want to include as much information on the counter as possible, but um, have it uh, be readable also from a distance. So we can't uh, make it too stuffed with little small numbers. And yeah, then we all always um, check for color blindness as well, because right. they are- I'm gonna ask you that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, we try, we try to make it uh, readable, to have the numbers as big as possible, um, but it's a hard part because there's a lot of information in these counters. I'm not sure, Eve, I think you have uh, the module open, right? Yeah, if you have the yeah, module, you can share your own screen. Yeah, maybe you can, can, let's, can let's do, do that. Screen share. Give me a second. I yeah. close it because I have problems with the cam. So in general, we want to make it uh, atmospheric. Yes. So that's why we decided to have um, like blue background for the air, air counters. Um, like some clouds and stuff, but, but uh, yeah, make it uh, recognizable which um, side uh, a counter is from. So we have uh, added a uh, blue or red stripe to make it uh, identifiable. Also, um, we want to color code the hierarchical uh, formations. And we have uh, different um, levels of hierarchy yeah, maybe you can uh, zoom in a bit. There we go. Well, I like the I like the artwork on the map off, right off the bat. Uh, very nice. But let's let's look at some counters. So, very cool. Uh, right. So we have uh, three areas or levels of uh, organization. We have the armies and um, the core level and the uh, division level. So at first we um, added a color stripe on each counter where we had uh, the army level on the left side, in the middle we had the core and on the right side we had the division. But it was pretty confusing to see um, on the map and to identify uh, where it belongs to. So we um, changed that. And now the um, background color of a counter is the army. So if you uh, could zoom out a bit, Eve. Zoom I'm out. not sure. Or if it, ah, it's yeah, just the per, folder gap is not folder gap. Yeah, there is no okay. color on. Yeah, but um, in the full, full uh, campaign, you can identify the army at a glance because the background color of the counter is different. Gotcha. Um, okay. All right. Then we have the the top color strip or stripe. I'm not sure. Um, that's the identifying the the core of a unit. Yeah, let's let's wait for a second. Ah, okay. I can see the color differences here now. Yeah, that's darker blue for uh, British Army of the Rhine and the North Egg, and then it's lighter blue for South Egg and for uh, North South Saint Egg and uh, the Seventh Army. And then you have the different cores. This is the first Belgian core. That's the, the yellow number. That's the yellow color. Okay. This is the headquarter of the division of the 16th Belgian um, division. Yeah, that's that's we, something actually we we did on previous games as well. So we mark the um, headquarter of a formation um, mainly in the formation color. Yes. So it's uh, easy to differentiate from the combat units. And um, you can find the headquarter for, for a specific uh, combat unit in a second. Right? And, so uh, yeah. so let, me ask, let me ask a quick question. So when, when, you cho when you're choosing production, uh, production values for your counters and your maps, uh, I mean, you, put, uh, you obviously put a lot of thought into the, the, the pellets that go, are going into this. When it comes to the actual tactile experience with the counters, uh, I've noticed it. Like Bug River has a the linen and satin finish. My personal experience is that's made them very, very slippery. Now there's not a lot of stacking, so it's not a, a huge deal, 
but they do tend to get slippery. So is it was that just a experiment with a format or is that sort of the modus operandi going forward? Yeah, so far that's um we use the same um same finish uh, the same finish for all our previous games. Gotcha. And um we didn't have any big stacks before, so it was not an issue before. But yeah. I'm not sure how it how it will work in this game. Because actually I like the feel of it. And the yes. of the linen finish, but um, yeah, it's true. So we have to experiment a bit. Um, on the other hand, we don't have huge stacks um, in this game so often. So during setup, um, we have some, but um, after the first turn, it gets less and less. Yeah. less there are no zones of control. You have to spread out. So yeah. otherwise. Right the enemy will march through your lines. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so, so, so I'll, I'll just, just to get... There, so finish, so go ahead. Sorry, just um, to get back to the formations. Yes. Um, if you zoom in, you can now um, see a different color in each of the NATO symbols. And that's uh, indicating the division. Uh, this, for example, is the headquarter of the 16th Panzer Division from the Belgians. And this is a brigade of the division. I so see. the same color inside the NATO symbol. Yeah. Okay. Same, so you see the same here. The second Panzer Grenadier Division from the Germans. It has this uh, this color, and these are the brigades, and this is the headquarter. And you yeah. can even see an air unit here, a helicopter, which has the same color stripe. For That's easy. Ah, dif- uh, oh, Roger that. Okay. Yeah. yeah very the second cool. Second Panzer Grenadier <laughs> is from the third German Corps, and this unit, Heeresfeder Regiment 36. Uh, gehört out um, is also from the third core and that's why it has this black bar if it would be for another core then it would have another color bar so normally you should uh, the colors should give you an indication of who is who for example here you see the eight guards army from the soviets it has this uh, blue color in, in, in on the top so you see uh, where they are this is the eight guards army and uh, the first guards tank army that's the green ones here nice nice and so now let's talk a little, little bit about the map uh and, and the uh the the area that we're going to cover first of all and then uh the obviously the scale and then the color once again color palette and terrain let's talk can someone tell us a little bit about that about your thinking behind it uh, scale is uh, 28 kilometers per hex. Uh, that's that's what I have taken over from from the older games, from the strike games, and uh, that fits well because this map was originally in, indeed intended to be one mapper, but for playability reasons, uh, for playability reasons, uh, Patrick has opted now for a two mapper. Also because there is this strategic map that comes with it. Yes. Yes. And there are some displays that you need for uh, air bases that are not on the map. As what you can see on the left and on the right hand side, that's indeed the air bases where you start your missions from. Oh, that's smart. I like so that. So this is a Soviet air base in East Germany in Sosten. Uh, that's where the A-50 is based, the AWACS, the AWACS from, from the Russians, uh, from the Soviets, I should say, sorry. And um, these units, so you have uh, you have a unit assignment mode that you have to give. Uh, is, is there an interception mode or is there an offensive mode? And it has two sorties, so it can make two missions per game turn. The first time when it comes back, it's going to be here. And the third time, it's going to be out of the game turn. And in the beginning of the turn, in the end turn, indeed, it will be put back on the, on the air base. So all of these air bases, they are also, of course, here on the map. And you only, you only put the air, air units on the map when you uh, start missions. So only these air units that are on an actual mission are on the map. Got it. And I and I uh, I love the fact that you're counting down as well. So it, you know, it's it, it, the American metaphor would typically be, you have two missions. So you used your first mission, and then you you put it on the one, and then you go to the two. But I'm I'm you know my brain thinks. I've got two, I've 
got two <laughs> and then I go down and I have now I have one and then I have none. So yeah. I, 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 that, I like that. Okay, never thought yeah. about the difference, but that's a cultural difference. It's interesting. Yeah, it is a cultural difference. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I see that a little bit in some of your rule writing with, with mm. Bug River and the Arkan. I have to sometimes stop and think, of, okay, now, what are they not saying and what are they saying? Because sometimes you'll be explicit, you'll be explicit about what's not possible, but not yeah, explicit that's... about what is possible. And that's a, that's a, a uniqueness that uh, you've got to turn your brain, you've got to turn your brain on to, to catch that, right? That's something you uh, wrote about a couple of days before, right? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was just. Uh, it, it, it struck me. It wasn't your rule. It was one of your rules that I was, I was noodling on about. But it was at the comment, a comment from another player in of another game system, who said, "Well, the rule doesn't say you can't, therefore you can." And I think, you know, my comment was, "Dude, that's not how it works, <laughs> right?" <laughs> but, but he was French, and so. You know, we, 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 we were chatting about that. And then I went back and that's when I posted a question on PGG. I said, so can I do anything? Because this says I can't do these three things. Does that mean that I can do anything else? All these other actions, you know, <laughs> attack, move, refit. All, are they all available? And the, 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 I think it was a Czech gentleman that said, yeah, well, of, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was you responding. I don't know. But... Uh, yeah, we try to uh, answer questions. Uh, sometimes other members on the uh, forums are faster than us. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Appreciate that uh, support as well. So yeah, they, great. you've got a great uh, a great community. In fact, there is one question here from uh, sure. a fan uh, asking what, what's projected release date for Task Force, and I, I don't want to take us off of uh, Red Strike, but uh, thoughts? No, we can we can also talk about other games, of course. Um, so the biggest challenge in uh, regards to task force is the translation of the rules. To have this also um, concise and that, that there are as uh, little doubts as possible. So that's what we are um, working on currently. So I guess we will have the um, rules done in yeah, maybe three to four weeks. And then we're going to start the, the final playtesting stage. So I guess early next year. That, that's the mm -hmm. target. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Now, tell tell me a little bit more. Uh, what's the what's the premise for Task Force, and where did you get the get the the, the rights to the game or the product the, the product from? Yeah, uh, Task Force is a Japanese design. Okay, it's a pretty uh, well known Japanese game, but there's not an uh, English language version so far. So we had to um, start from scratch. That was uh, basically um, using Board Game Geek and skimming through different designs and stumbled upon this um, particular design. I thought it was very interesting. So mm. um, I got in, in touch with the designer or with the rights holder. I think it, it was a, a command magazine. I'm not sure yet. Um, but uh, I contacted them. And made, we made a first translation of the words, and I said, yeah, it's, uh, it's fitting pretty well in, in our product line. Because it's interactive, it has small map boards, um, so you can finish a scenario in one evening. You have different oh, really? scenarios in there, so that's pretty cool. And it, it has some neat mechanics regarding um, dummies and fog of war. Very so cool. I also see, a, um, yeah, right. This co uh, comment: one map games are very much appreciated. So that's uh, also something we love to do, and we did publish only one mapper so far. We're working on uh, publishing more one map games that are also playable in one evening or one weekend. Um, but for this uh, particular Red Strike game, it's not possible because there's simply too much uh, going right. on. So, yeah, the two map uh, solution is the best <laughs> we could do. Yeah, no, but you can't play it in one sitting, that's for sure. No. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, it's also um, something we should mention, um, that we are working on one map scenarios, on smaller scenarios as well, like uh, famous okay. folder gap. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's playable in one evening, or it should be. 
very Good very enough. nice yeah and that's i think that's important when you when you're looking to bring a game to the table for gamers that if it's going to be a multi-mapper there's so many people who buy who are like okay first question how many one map scenarios are there how do i how much space is this going to take up i think i think it's smart of you to at least try and bring in some smaller shorter scenarios because in this particular system i know it's a slower playing relatively speaking that it's because of the constant interaction that tends to it tends to slow things down a little bit so you you're both doing something but that all takes a little bit longer right as opposed to yeah. one, one one dude moving all this stuff and another guy moving all this stuff which uh, so that's a trade-off there but uh, that's great that you're bringing that in uh, yeah i see a, a comment here from jeff hi jeff and um and there we go hey jeff <laughs> thanks for your support Right, Jeff is also uh, involved together with John. Wonderful. And uh, John is uh, right now working on a vessel module for the game, which uh, we have the first version, and uh, that's pretty cool. So that's it cool enhances cool. Uh, play tests for us because so far, if we have um, games that we can um, play uh, so in solitaire mode, we use uh, Zun Tzu. It's a program. Right. It's pretty intuitive, yeah. and yeah. Um, you can create um, modules for it very fast. And you can exchange um, files if you have an update of some counters right. on the map. Um, but it's not uh, possible for Red Strike. So here we really need to be interactive. Uh, yeah. Have you thought about using Tabletop Simulator as well, or is that what you were just showing just then? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, that was Sun Tzu. That was Sun Tzu. That was Sun Tzu. Yeah. Okay. I thought I thought it was either Sun Tzu or Tabletop Simulator. But, uh, yeah, Tabletop Simulator good. could be an option, but uh, we have to just figure out yeah. how yeah. to do. Vassal is great. Vassal is great. Yeah, Vassal's great. I mean, it gives you gives you log uh, log files so you can see what the players were doing, which mm. will, uh, helps with your testing. So I think that's awesome. Uh, Sun Tzu is also great. It's very nice to play with it, but it has it does not have a multiplayer. Um, interface for the moment okay that's a little bit the problem with this model uh, fabrizio has asked something yes um regiments of course yeah squadrons uh, then there would be even more counters now regiments maybe yeah mr detail guy fabrizio yeah yes yes he's uh, he's one of those monster game designers just to, just, to, yeah. just don't, don't worry about him it's all right. Uh, it's all right. I have his games uh, in my collection, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah I have the Iron yeah. Iron Sky at least. Yeah. yeah. Doctor Four is uh, out of print, Fabrizio. Just to reprint it. I will buy. It. All right. Let's see. Okay. So now, uh, so we talked about sort of the game system, the mechanics. The we talked about how you you're sort of honoring the sequence of play, uh, but really revising a whole lot of the the game mechanics for movement and combat. Potentially a lot more Chrome as optional rules, which is interesting. The counters, are, uh, now that I've got to see them up close and had a little uh, explanation, look fantastic, and the map looks gorgeous. We mentioned uh, single map scenarios. How many scenarios will come in the game? What's the or what's the plan for? You may not know yet, but how many scenarios will come? No, no we have a plan. <laughs> have a plan. Excellent. All right. <laughs> but the plan never survives first contact with the enemy. Apparently. Yeah. Now is the enemy Patrick or is the enemy the the, the, <laughs> uh, the enemy is the detail? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Time, right. time is running. Uh, we, we have we want to bring it out uh, and this year beginning next year so the time is running and the plan is to have at least uh, four in I would call them engagement scenarios that's learning scenarios yeah we have only ground to ground combat only air to air combat naval 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 so that you learn the system that you learn how, how it works uh, learning scenarios uh, but they are pretty nice already so it's not really that basic but it's what it is Okay. Then uh, for the moment we have planned three battle scenarios that would be then Fulda Gap and uh, two others that uh, we are discuss still discussing, but uh, okay. that will also be included, at least these three. Yeah. And then four campaign scenarios where you play the whole, the whole, uh, the whole war, um, uh, which will be three times with Warsaw Pact attacking and one time one offensive of NATO. One offensive of NATO, interesting. Yeah. And would the 
assuming that this is an outrageous success, which I, I hope it is for you, uh, would there be an intention to expand this particular system in, into other theaters of the conference? Of course. Of course. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, a, that's what you call a softball question in, of course. in the United States. That's a softball question. So. And, I would even have liked to to uh, to bring out a smaller game first, so that people get um, get the system, get to know the system, and want to play it, and also to find maybe some um, enhancements. Um, but we went for the big one right from the start, so that's okay. Yeah, maybe something like Falklands. That would have been very nice. Yeah, mm. yeah. that's yeah. something that I would really like to do. Uh, because it's also air, naval, ground, so you have everything in it. Uh, it's small, but it's everything. It has everything. So that's that would be one of my uh, my next uh, projects if I if we have a little bit of success with this one. Very cool. Yeah, so that may would I, be fascinating. Yeah. May I answer this uh, this question? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so um, I think red strike uh, maps will not be mounted. Um, as I think it's very difficult to have uh, multi-map games uh, with mounted maps because um, somehow due to um, production uh, issues, you will never uh, have the chance to have them align 100%. So that's why we decided to bring out all one map games um, with mounted maps from now on because uh, crossing the line first uh, edition was with a paper map, but after that, we always uh, want to go with mounted maps. But multi map uh, games that's difficult, yeah. unfortunately, because I like mounted maps, but... right? Right, yeah. and I think yeah. it's also a matter of weight <laughs> because <Well. laughs> can talk about it. <laughs> the game will yeah. weigh like 10 kilos. <laughs> yeah, we uh, th there's it, I'm agnostic, I, I really don't care. Right. If it's mounted, that's nice. If it's not mounted, I get it. As long as it's got folds in it that I can fold the damn thing up and get it all back in the box, I'm good. I'm good to go. I can put Plex down on it. I typically put Plex down regardless because, you know, I'm always knocking my coffee on my water over or whatever. But uh, I think um, I think there's a. It's interesting the pre the, the preferences people have for mounted versus paper i i'm not sure why there's a why that has to be a uh, kind of like a jihad thing uh right so it's like oh i've got to have mounted maps or that's, i don't care um so you're going to, you're not going to Essen this year i imagine if you're trying to potentially organize a trip to the united states uh, right um, it's it's a matter of timing and mm -hmm. uh, prioritization and um also this year it's uh, difficult with the COVID situation sure, sure. because it was well, so unsure how, how it uh, would be this year so i think next year uh, we're gonna um, go there for sure if it takes place because you never yeah. know uh, how the situation it was but yeah, yeah. yeah this year uh, we're gonna be in the united states but we're gonna um, visit a small convention in vicksburg okay now which which one is that which one is yeah, that I have to uh, check for the name. <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. Well, so, and you're also coming through to Texas with Dallas slash Denton area, right? Right. Yeah. So, so if you do plan on going to the coast, uh, you're going to drive right by my town. So you will have to stop in and I will buy you lunch. All right. So, so, so whereabouts was it? Uh, uh, well, you're, you said you're going to your place. My uh, place, place. City, the city I'm in is Austin, Texas. Austin. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because it's it's right on the way. We wanted to to come from Dallas and go down to uh, Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi. To visit yeah. the Corpus Christi to visit the uh, aircraft carrier. Yes. And yep. we want to take a rental car, so should be easy enough. <laughs> should be easy enough. I am I'm going to be terrified to see the two of you on the road over here, but that's fine. Uh, you'll be okay. Uh, Corpus is uh, Corpus is only, I think, four hours or four and a half hours from from us. So, so if you time it right, we'll yeah. we'll get we'll we'll corner you here and right. fill, you, fill you up with Texas barbecue and whatever else you're interested in having. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, perfect. Well, okay. So let's. So 
when did what, what's the expected release date or planned release date for this? Um, so we plan uh, to have the uh, print files ready um, until the end of the year. That's the target we're, we're planning with and we're working on, but you'll never know. So focus uh, of sure. priority number one for us is to have the um, game in a, in a ready developed state. So we wouldn't um, make any half-baked uh, things here. So it could be that we have to postpone, but um, according right. to our plan, it, it would be end of the year. Yeah. And do you, do you print in Europe or do you print in China? Yes, yeah, so far we uh, printed in Poland in Europe. Yeah. And then actually we had some difficulties in shipping the games over to the United States mm. because it took yes. some time and then we had um, some orders going in because we thought the uh, games have arrived in, um, in the United States, but somehow they were stuck at customs and then it just uh, took weeks and weeks for them to arrive. So yes, to yes, I, I recall. But I tell you what, though, you guys did a great job with your customer yeah. service on that. Yeah, thanks. We, we're trying. And um, I also always hope to reach every customer who has uh, any headache. But yeah. Yeah, so that was great. So I, thought I, pre I appreciated your uh, the, the actions you took there. All right. So let me see. Let me see if we've got any other questions that might be uh, with us touching base on uh were that were, were there other so were there other topics that you wanted to cover off on that i didn't bring up that you think are valuable uh eve so patrick for uh, potential buyers to know or world war three fans uh yeah i mean um we will uh, revise the rule book next week so um as you may know we have uh, uploaded the rules on our, our website for the game we also uploaded some examples of play, yes. so everybody can can make himself or herself an impression of that. And um, then next week, when we have the new rules version available, we're gonna post them and upload them. And um, yeah, then we have the the vessel module in place shortly. So um, if anyone uh, wants to support in playtesting, please uh, raise your hand, drop us yes. an email. Please. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, playtesting is now a priority, and uh, we would like to have some people that um, that could have a look at it and give feedback. Feedback is all. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Well, I know that Jeff and John, uh, well, yeah. John in particular is an avid uh, World War Three war game player, and also a great playtester for a number of other companies and titles and things like that so i'm sure you'll get lots of value out of their feedback and then we've got you know folks folks in here in the audience and i'll i'll put a note out to everybody to you know have that uh, make them aware of it so that they can yeah, perhaps, cool. uh, try and help out well good yeah, uh, alan uh, alan uh, just uh, wrote a comment about yeah. jack green right yeah alan you're right um, that's one of the main reasons uh, we're going to Vicksburg. We want to uh, meet Jack because um, he also uh, said some of our, our games, or all of our games, actually. And um, he also is a game designer. So we are working on a game together um, regarding Bismarck. Um, yeah, so we, we're going to have some beers and talk uh, about the games. That sounds uh, that sounds like a good idea. Here's a question for you. Can you comment on a bit on the general mechanics regarding the upcoming bit? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> no, is that, it, yeah, so we're pr probably not, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, sure. I, uh, I can um, okay, give you some, some insight. Um, it's based on the second edition Bismarck from uh, Jack that he published in the, I think, in the early 80s something and um, so it's a double blind movement game mm. so each player has uh, his own map board and um, can only see his own units and then you have a kind of a cat and mouse game with the allied player searching for the german uh, ships and then um, yeah if you meet on the map then battles uh, happen on the operational map but we change a lot of stuff from the original 
So basically the search procedures are completely different. Mm. Um, the air units uh, work completely um, different. We have a completely revised Comet system. So in the um, easy Comet variant, um, let's call it like that, we don't have a uh, hex map like it was before, but we uh, it, it's simplified because we said the, the focus of the game should be the um, hunt hunting part. And then if you meet, yeah, you can resolve the battle, but it shouldn't take forever. Uh, right, so. right. Oh. Kind of uh, reminds me a little bit of Atlantic Chase, but with a different, obviously a different search mechanic, right? Because it's it's right. not in, it's not uh, double blind. Yeah, because Atlantic Chase is all about the chase. It's really not about the combat, uh, yeah. well, uh, even with the advanced rules, I think. But uh, anyway, all right, well, excellent. Okay, well, look, guys, I... Uh, Oh, there we go. One fifty-eight, right? Uh, my time. So that's a, an hour of uh, pretty interesting conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us. I'm glad you're feeling better, Eves. Uh, Thank you. I, if there's more that we can do here at the big board or uh, the folks here, please you know, pop me a note or an email. Um, I'm probably not a great play tester, uh, but I'm happy to happy to try and chip in if I can, at least have a look at the rules and, and uh, you know, sort of go, hey, what does this really mean? Stuff like that. Um, but happy to help however I can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having also, uh, also, I want to, to uh, shout out to the community, right? Because we get uh, tremendous feedback. Um, yeah. That's really cool. Really uh, helpful. Yeah, you've got, I, I, you have a very solid fan base, which is fantastic. So uh, yeah, I'm, that's glad, awesome. I'm, I'm glad they're supporting you like that, Patrick. It's cool. All right, guys. All Thank the, you. Yeah, all the best.